first flying in 1962, the VC-10 was a response to BOAC's requirement for an airliner able to cope with the so-called Empire routes. Routes with short runways, hot temperatures and high altitude that excluded many other aircraft such as Boeing 707s. The fact that these requirements were soon to be obsolete, together with some ill-founded doubts voiced by BOAC, meant the aircraft did not get the best of starts. However, the VC-10 was to prove the critics wrong. Although only 54 were built, many still remain in service with the RAF, where they fulfill transport and tanker roles. It's a great shame. It's always going to be a competition between the VC-10 and the 707, and I think that the 707 had the benefit of a lot of backing, a lot of American support, a lot of financial support. The VC-10 was rather unfortunate to have, have lost out in that, and I think it was a great loss. It's certainly a, a very beautiful aircraft, but it's certainly a very capable aircraft and as an airliner, um, it still rates as perhaps one of, if not the, the fastest airliner now still flying. But certainly from a, an operator's perspective now, um, it is a fantastic aircraft to fly um, and it is a real privilege to have been part of that um, bit of a British aviation heritage, I think. The RAF operate three different versions of the VC-10. The C-1K can carry either 146 passengers or cargo, as well as being able to feed fuel from its original tanks to other aircraft via a refueling pod on each wing. The more numerous K-3s and K-4s have a third hose unit mounted on the fuselage. The K-4 can carry 68 tonnes of fuel and the K-3 can manage 78, courtesy of additional tanks in what was the passenger compartment. The unusual seating arrangements on the v RAF VC-10s is that uh, all the seats uh, face rearward. Um, this was designed because most of the impact uh, would be taken in the uh, seat backrest rather than on lap straps. And to be honest, I'd rather f fly in one of these than a lot of the civilian aircraft. It's like the old um, decent car syndrome where you close a door on a, on a car and you get a good thud, you feel safe in it and the VC-10 is very, one of those very much like that. Um, you know it's got so many redundant backup systems that if anything goes wrong you'll be quite safe. The main reason we've managed to keep this aircraft in, in, in service for 40 years is that to start with it's a British built aircraft and everything about it is solid. Most of the gauges are analog gauges so that we're able to, to, to manage without them sometimes if we really had to and there's ways around everything. Also, I think a lot of uh, credit has to go to the way the Air Force services jets. We put a lot of um, time and effort and manpower into servicing these jets and, and we've got some very, very skilled tradesmen. What's basically happening is it's, it's kind of like the 10,000 mile servicing on a, on a car. Um, the aircraft does, uh, does about 18 months of flying um, and then comes in for a, a bit of a, a thorough check over. It was a very new thing to fly an aircraft this fast and at, and at this height. Um, so I think people were pretty nervous about how high the thing was going to fly and quite what was going to happen up there to, you know, to a bunch of passengers really. So if you look at the structure of the aircraft, it's bomb proof. I mean, it's unbelievable the, the sort of extra strength and the extra weight that's gone into this aircraft. To keep pace with modern aviation requirements, the aircraft has to be periodically fitted with new equipment, such as in this case, where an anti-collision system is being installed. The VC-10 is powered by four Rolls-Royce Conway bypass engines, each giving 20,000 pounds of thrust. The entire thrust of the, the engine, which is a considerable amount of thrust, goes through this one small thrust pillar here. Um, you can see the engine mounting bolts uh, are mounted either side here, and um, they take no thrust at all. They purely support the engine in its, in its place, two more at the back. So you've got four bolts holding the engines in, but all the thrust is going through this thrust pillar here and this one mountain, which it always amazes me that the thing doesn't just rip itself clean of its mountains. Although the RAF placed orders of its own, it also converted aircraft previously owned by commercial airlines. The inherent strength of the airframe is ideally suited to the demands of its current refueling role. The wings are made from a, a series of large planks, as you can see here. These have been machined from a, a solid billet, uh, giving a, quite an integral strength by the, uh, the U-shaped channeling, which is actually formed into the material. 
and uh, this plank, as you can see, ends just here. Well, this is the, uh, the Mark 32 air refueling pod. You've got the rammer turbine at the front with a variable pitch propeller, and this basically powers the, uh, the internal workings of the pod. Uh, as you work back, you've got the control logic box, which uh, in fact is very similar to the switching mechanism in a washing machine, where it just gradually rotates around to control the timings. You come back, you've got a, a drum unit, which has got the hose actually on it, which at the far end, you have the drogue assembly, which is connected to the hose and is released back into the airflow to uh, allow the receiver aircraft to take fuel. We need to have tankers, we need to have the VC-10 and, and indeed the TriStar at the moment um, to be able to deploy our fast jets and our large aircraft to wherever we, the UK, need, need those aircraft to go. And I think that's a very important point to realise. Whilst we may see reductions in other areas, we may see technology taking over, but for air refuelling, while we have uh, the responsibilities that we have, uh, it's very hard to reduce the numbers significantly. Rotate. And um, refueling fast jets it really is the, the bread and butter for us as, uh, as tanker pilots and indeed that's the whole point having a tanker. It's a force enabler, it's a force multiplier. It extends the endurance and the range of, uh, of any fast jets, either in the UK for training purposes or indeed uh, on operations abroad or on what we call trails, which are our means of getting fighters from the UK deployed um, overseas. Um, what we have a procedure, the, the uh, fast jets will arrive on uh, the right hand side and check in and then we'll send them behind the two wing, wing hoses in pairs, uh, refuel them and then they'll move out to the left hand side and they'll depart from there. One of, one of uh, the issues we have on operations, if you have uh, operations that you've seen uh, in the media recently in Iraq, um, obviously the sky is full of a, a large number of tankers. The efficient way to use those is to what we call consolidate fuel. So if you've got two or three tankers that are getting down to perhaps a quarter or a third of their fuel load, the efficient way to do that is for one tanker to consolidate all that fuel, uh, which will let two other tankers go off station uh, and that lets them be uh, serviced and turned around for their, for their next mission. It is, it's possibly um, the, the most challenging and the most exciting flying that, that we do in the VC-10, um, simply because it's uh, something of an anathema to be so close to another large aircraft. Um, that said, um, it's a procedure well practiced um, that we train for regularly, um, so there is a set procedure for doing it, but it's certainly very satisfying uh, to meet up with another tanker in the air and, and take on an, off, an onload of about 30 tonnes of fuel. Uh, and it certainly makes deployments um, run that much more smoothly. The tail has, got, it has a high wing on it, um, which means it's affected by lots of, of, of airflow. Now in our air, air to air refueling sortie, um, behind another VC-10, the jet wash from the, from the aircraft ahead of us does tend to hit that tail, which makes the tail shake. And if you were to be able to see it, you could visibly see it moving. You can look at the tail by using the periscope, which we get stowed down the back, and that gives us a good view of what's going on back there. There is a story. Uh, I personally wasn't involved in the uh, operations over Afghanistan, um, but my colleagues that, that were there report a story where uh, two American F-14s, who were very short for gas, um, were given directions, they were given the option of either going to a, an American tanker or refueling from a VC-10, and they uh, elected to go to the VC-10 uh, out of preference.
I just think the VC-10 is it's been a marvellous servant for the Royal Air Force, but if, whenever you fly all around the world, people come and talk to you about the VC-10. They love the shape of the VC-10. It looks a good aeroplane, uh, and indeed it is a good aeroplane. It's got, we've got a, a bit of a place in British history, I suppose. You'd be surprised at where you can go in the world and find VC-10 enthusiasts you know, that come running across the tarmac to meet you. Um, and also the, the compliments that you get when you taxi in at some obscure airport and uh, air traffic control say thanks very much and that looks lovely. So yes, it's certainly sometimes surprising that you can go to the darkest parts of the world and still find a VC-10 enthusiast hiding somewhere. For, for its age, it's remarkably advanced actually. British engineering has always got the hallmark of going for the, the elegant design rather than the uh, just it will, it will do. We like the perhaps the, the slightly more advanced gold-plated solution and I think the VC-10 is perhaps a fine example of that. Oh, uh, when the aircraft goes, uh, it'll be a very sad day. I think it's a, a beautiful aircraft even now. Uh, I feel very fortunate to have been um, associated with the, the VC-10, not just the air transport role but the air refueling role. Um, and, and more importantly, I suppose, I feel very privileged to have been a squadron commander, to have commanded one of the VC-10 squadrons. Um, and that'll certainly be one of the greatest memories I'll hold with me. It'll be a very sad day when uh, the VC-10 gets phased out. Um, there'll be a lot of uh, sad faces. Um, when that date ends up being, uh, we're, we're yet to find out, but I think there's a fair amount of life left in the VC-10 yet. Yeah.